our speaker this evening is the clinical director at the Kentucky Eye Institute, the medical director of Kepler Vision, the chief clinical editor for the Review of Optometry, and the associate professor at the Kentucky College of Optometry. So please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Paul Carpecki. Thank you, Ian. Thanks for that warm virtual uh, welcome as well, whatever that is. But I appreciate that. Great way to start. And it really is amazing to hear all the countries that are, are watching. And, and thank you for making time. You know, I'm sure different time zones and says a lot. And to have, you know, 400 uh, involved really is a impressive, says a lot about the profession, actually, that they're, you know, continuing to learn and advance. And thank you to, to Conan Medical for the opportunity to get to present. I've had this technology for about a year. So you'll notice some of my cases at the end kind of are cases I've had more than a year ago, but then the technology helped in terms of the discernment of what was going on. But as mentioned, I practice in Lexington, Kentucky, and this is a vital technology in my clinic. So it's a wonderful opportunity to get to present on it. You know, I, I have to really start with this, and we're going to have a, a number of, you know, poll questions as we go through as well. But this is probably the first uh, best slide I could begin with. You know, Marcus Gunn, obviously, as we get into pupil testing, is, is kind of the, the key to this. Marcus Gunn was a Scottish ophthalmologist who developed this, the ability to look at pupils and discern neurological issues. He was born in 1850 in Donet, Scotland. He died in uh, November 29, 1909, so over 100 years ago in Hindhead, England. His education, University of Edinburgh. The point being, his assessment of how to look at pupils, um, actually, he, he died over 100 years ago. So when the technology, when he first introduced it, it's got to be at least 120, 150, 130 years old. So it just shows that it's amazing how these technologies have existed or these abilities, to, and yet they aren't the greatest ways of determining disease. And thank goodness for new innovations like iKinetics, which we get to talk about today, that have really allowed us to get to the next level, you know, and now finally be in the right century, not two centuries back. Yet at the same time, to credit Marcus Gunn, at least he knew the importance of pupil measurements and how it all ties in and, and why it's so critical to make this measurement. So let's begin uh, with a poll question, actually. I think would be a good time to do that. Ian, are you the one who controls that component? Uh, yes, I've just launched it. So we'll give everyone a few minutes to, uh, to respond. It should be on everybody's screen now. Pupillary light reflex testing is select one of the following. All right, I'll give you a moment to, to vote for one of those three. I think this will kind of help us, you know, determine exactly where we are at the beginning and be honest about your answers, what you think, maybe not necessarily what you think should be the answer, but what you really and where you're at. No one knows who's answering. I can't pull out someone who, who gave a poor answer on this webinar, trust me. I'd like to. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't wouldn't do it. But nevertheless, it's you know this gives you a chance to just be anonymous. Put down whatever you're thinking, and not necessarily what you believe we sh should answer. All right, we've got a majority voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close this up. All right, Ian, can you share any of the data yet? There it is. All right, now I've got to make this bigger somehow. I'm going to have to have you read it, Ian, because I can't see the, I can see pupillary light reflex testing is dot, 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 but I can't see the actual answers. Yeah, no problem. So 18% said it's an old technique that's not clinically valuable. 54% said it's routinely delegated to my text with confidence. And 28% said it's better performed by my MD colleagues. Ah, interesting. Great. Well, all right. Got a good, honest crew, which is great to have. Let's hit this a little bit and kind of touch on some of those as we go through it. So, I'm not going to get too much into this because every one of you have seen this slide, whether it was back in school, and I have some classmates I know that are on the call, and where we were uh, back in school, some of my Canadian colleagues, and and really, you know, we did see this slide, although 
don't know how much we paid attention to it. And yet it is kind of a critical one today because we realize how important it is. But I don't want to go through every aspect of pupillary light reflex other than to take you through a few key things. There's both an afferent pathway and an efferent pathway. And of course, that eventually gets through the Andrew Westfall nucleus. But what I want to highlight regarding this specifically is that um, if you look at the diagram, you'll see a couple things. Number one, retinal ganglion cells transmit the light signal to the nerve. Why is that important? Well, what comes to mind when you hear of retinal ganglion cells? Well, glaucoma does. That's a key condition where you have neuropathy. And with that, you have that increased ability to affect some of the pathways through the optic nerve. And actually, it's the retinal nerve fiber layers, and in particular, the ganglion complex. And that's what retinal ganglion cells are. We used to think the retinal ganglion complex was related more to the macula. Today, we understand it's more related to the nerve and the pathways, and likely one of the best predictors of glaucoma. And yet, if you want to go upstream from that, it's actually the pupillary response that plays such a key role in identifying damage that could be involved there. Um, if you look at the efferent pathway, which again is, is going to the opposite, the auxiliary ganglion innervates the iris sphincter muscle, and that, of course, causes the change. A few things stand out here. Number one, this is not a fast pathway. Uh, I mean, relative to anything else that you would see, like our color perception or something like that, the fact that it has to go through the afferent, then the efferent, you have time. And that difference in time allows us to get some measurements when it comes to the pupil. The second thing is we talked about retinal ganglion cells, which are so critical to diagnosis, such as disease. And the third thing, really, I think of this slide that's important is if you look at the pupillary light reflex diagram on your left and how you go from the chiasm into the optic tract, oculomotor nerve, and then especially that central endurosphal nucleus, that's quite a pathway. Look at the size of the eyes compared to the pathway. So guess what happens? In that same area, we house significant number of the cranial nerves to the brain. So that's why when there's damage here, you're going to pick up on something like a third nerve palsy, which could be extremely serious, meaning a pending aneurysm, pending death in some patients. And so it really becomes quite important for us to be able to differentiate that based on pupillary light reflex, and in particular, relative afferent pupillary light differences between the two eyes. So I think those are the three things that really stand out when you look at this diagram is how the system works retinal ganglion cells, which you associate with glaucoma, but certainly it applies to a lot of things, and then how much can really be housed in here. And that's why it's so important to be able to look at pupillary light reflexes to diagnose serious diseases, whether it be a third nerve palsy, multiple sclerosis, numerous other path pathologies that would exist in this pathway. So what is an RAPD? And again, nothing new for this group. Uh, you know, it really also known as a Marcus gun pupil, it's a defect in the pupillary reflex due to damage to the optic nerve or retinal disease. It really doesn't matter what causes the pathway to not complete its transition. You're going to have a decrease. And you know, and you guys all know this, but essentially it's recommended in a number of positive diagnoses. The reason we put the preferred practice pattern in ophthalmology is because that's the one that gets referred to a lot in legal expert cases and things like that. But nevertheless, if we had an optometric one, and we do have one, but they're not up to date for primary open angle glaucoma and for pupillary testing, it's required for the comprehensive eye exam. So that would apply in optom optometry and in ophthalmology. I think also important as you look at this is that keep in mind as you're putting the light into the eye, say you have a really good pathway in the left eye, and you all know this, that means light's going to get through very well. Both pupillars are going to constrict the way that they should. As you pass the light into the bad eye, that's going to cause obviously less of a pathway. Think of it as a filter there, and then the other side pupil is not going to constrict. And we know that, but that's how we train our technicians. That's how we have other people do it. And you noticed it was interesting there. We had a group of doctors that said the majority of us, 50 some percent, hand that off to a technician. We hope that they can do a good measurement. The question there is hope. I, I've had technicians who've completely confused the two. I've had technicians that have come in and said, I can't tell if this is, can you check it? And I've checked it and it was extremely obvious. Not to put down our technicians, some are trained very, very well. And I'm blessed to have really good, I, I saw 51 patients today. So I have a really good staff and I'm the only doctor. So it, it really has been, um, you know, so they play a key role and I would think mine are okay, but it's not that easy to do. It's not them. It's not that easy. And yet it's critical. Look at all the examples of disorders that can cause a re relative afferent pupillary defect. The first one that comes to mind for me is glaucoma. Uh, rare, now you could have a symmetric glaucoma, maybe late stage, 
where uh, the eyes wouldn't have an RAPD because both are damaged, both have neuropathy. But I will tell you, I have yet to have an early diagnostic case of glaucoma that didn't have an RAPD. So for me, that becomes really important. And yet I think it picks up the disease way earlier than, than other, at least alerts me to do other testing like OCT, for example. Brain and intraocular tumors, optic neuritis, severe macular degeneration. Now this is the other spectrum. You would have to have a severe AMD in one eye. And when it comes to glaucoma, it's usually the mild that's asymmetric to moderate. Retinal infections like CMV, MS. I have uh, one of the top MS researchers in the country or perhaps the world at the University of Kentucky. And he has sent over patients to have this test done um, for his uh, MS studies. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and of course, we didn't even get into third nerve palsies and other key pathologies that are critical. Things um, like Horner syndrome, which can indicate a pancos tumor of the lungs. All of those, and you think about, you know, Horner's where you get uh, ptosis, anhydrosis, and meiosis. I know it doesn't always happen that you get all three, by the way, but, but that's kind of that triple uh, component that you think of in Horner's. And keep in mind, Horner's could be a congenital, in which case we're not as concerned, but it could also be caused by a, by a lung tumor known as a panco. So these are critical conditions that we need to be diagnosing at the primary care level. And as I talked about just a moment ago, the swinging flashlight test, you know, basically means that both eyes are going to have, you know, no light. People should be the same. A normal right response is to shine the eye in one eye and both pupils constrict. Again, it has to go with the pathway through the edge or west wall nucleus. Both should respond the same way as a direct and consensual response. In the case of a relative afferent pupillary defect, when you shine the light in the affected eye, the other eye doesn't constrict like it should. And that's how we are able to make the determination. Well, that seems straightforward and easy. It seems simple, but think about a dark iris. Think about a person with early disease. Think about your early glaucoma where you have asymmetry, but yet it's um, really at the beginning of the disease. The only way you're going to be able to differentiate a quarter or a half or even one level of afferent pupillary defect is to use these neutral density filters. Um, don't have a poll here, but I'd love to ask how many people have neutral density filters in their office? And number two, how many use it? I probably have some in some drawer somewhere. I have no idea. I've never used them, wouldn't want to take the time to use them, wouldn't, wouldn't have the ability to even know what I'm looking for as I try to neutralize the two eyes and to get to that level I need it to be. And keep in mind, significant relative afferent pupillary defects are anything above 0.3. I told you how hard it is to pick up a half an RAPD, let alone a one. Good luck trying to do that. The only way you're going to do it is with neutral density filters, and you better be really good at it. You know, and every time you do a webinar, there is somebody who is good at it and spends her life really understanding this area and does a lot of neuro-ophthalmology or neuro-optometry. And so for them, they say, oh yeah, but I don't think that's me or the majority of our profession or either of the professions. And many times we have to put a 20 doctor lens in front of there, or like me, I've just advanced to better technology rather than trying to figure this out and take the time that I don't have. And today in COVID, the last thing I wanna do is stand in front of a patient at you know arm's length and being exposed, even though we check their temperature um, and we wear our masks and our gloves. So still, I'd rather wanna be that close and doing all of these neutral density filters to try and figure out an APD. No, thank you. Give me a test they could do from a distance like the iKinetics, I'm happy with that. But I do think it's essential. I do think a lot of us have realized over the years that because we can't measure it very well, it's not that important. That's not the case. It is absolutely critical. Ian, why don't we do a, a quick quiz here and then we'll go through a little bit of our testing on. Okay. Here's your question. I do a thorough pupil exam during this percentage of my comprehensive exam. So thorough pupil exam, what percentage of your comprehensive eye exams? Is it a small percentage? Is it a high percentage? Do you do it every single time? And of course, this assumes your um, technician, your staff might be doing it, but I want to get a gauge of how often it's being done in a comprehensive eye exam. All right, I'm going to leave the poll open for another 30 seconds or so.
Okay, here we go. All right, you take us through it again, Ian. All right, so 4% said not at all. 16% like said about a quarter of the time. 13% said about half the time. 18% said three quarters of the time, 75%. And then half of the audience said they do a thorough pupil exam 100% of the time. All right. So go ahead and identify the people who do it. Zero percent of the, I'm just kidding. We can't do that. But, you know, I do appreciate all the honesty because that's where really what we, we learn from and gain. Um, and I think I actually empathize with those who say zero or 25 percent of the time. I mean, we do it before iKinetics. We did it 100 percent of the time, but but it was staff doing it. And I don't know if they really did the ultimate job. It was kind of a quick check off the because it's an essential test to get reimbursed and also because we know it's important and we know that you can identify everything from a brain tumor to an aneurysm to MS to pancose tumor to glaucoma. But I don't know if we ever did it all that well. So anybody who said I don't do it, I would empathize because I don't know that my staff, especially I go through, th I'm in three different clinics and I'm not sure if every single one of the staff members do this right or know what they're doing, even though I've tried to go through it with them. In the olden days, now I have an eye kinetics, and so I know it's being done right. But my point is, I love the honesty and also understand the answers because it does make sense, um, especially when it's a test. I mean, take a look at the iris on the right. I mean, how are you going to pick up that dark pupil by doing a swinging flashlight test? Yet it is required for billing. It uncovers potentially severe diseases, ranges from brain tumors to pending brain aneurysms to lung cancer. Why would anyone skip this test? Well, a lot of reasons. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, it, how would you, as I said, differentiate a dark iris like that and be able to pick up a 0.3 RAPD? That's what's required to be significant, 0.3. I can't tell a 0.3. I have trouble picking up a one with a swinging flashlight. It's subjective, meaning that you're looking to see if there's a change as you go from eye to eye, hoping that as you're looking at one eye with the light there that you can discern the difference to the next eye. Uh, we talked about the dark irises, the pupil, the lightings. Uh, pupils become sluggish with age where it's hard to tell if that's hippus or is that just not responding or is that or APD. It's time consuming if you need to use the filters. Um, staff have a difficult time. Often they just kind of go through it and write down per lot. And it has a very low yield compared to what it should yield as far as accuracy. Think about all the glaucoma patients, 3 million a year. Uh, I doubt we get 3 million RAPDs. So the point is we, we don't get a high percentage that actually test the way they're supposed to. So I would see why people would say 25% or 0% because of the difficulty in getting what we need. And yet it's an essential test. It's a required test, has huge value. In fact, one of the best quotes I've seen here in the American, in the uh, journal uh, that was published in 2014 is subtle RAPDs that are difficult to assess with traditional methods have been shown to be clinically significant in glaucoma size. I believe it's one of the biggest indicators in the early disease for determining glaucoma. And so it becomes an automatic test in all of our patients. And I have had exactly this, patients who measured an RAPD that was 0.56. I said, wow. I mean, it takes only about, you know, less than a minute to do this pupil test, less than it should take to do a good swinging flashlight test. And it's recorded. And I look at that, I see 0.56. And I think, oh, let me look at those nerves a little more carefully. Sure enough, I see 0 0.65, 0 0.7 CDs, run my OCT, boom, glaucoma. Can't tell you how many times that's happened. Would I have assessed the nerve that well? Maybe not, especially when they're 0 0.55, 0 0.6, and they're close between the two eyes. And when pressures were normal, I don't know that I would have. So it's a big indicator for me to look for other conditions. And it is that important when it comes to glaucoma. If you look at the pre preferred practice guidelines in glaucoma, you'll notice the second item of key elements is pupil examination there for a reason. And again, I think we've overlooked the value of this technology and how important it is to do this testing because of the difficulty in a test that's been around for 150 years. You know, we really need something new. Everything advances. Look at the technologies and what's happened. I mean, we don't use the same phones. We don't, were there phones 150 years ago? I guess there were. Obviously, they've come a long ways to where we are today with our smartphones. An objective affordable alternative is the iKinetics. As you see, that's the iKinetics device on the image. Patients simply look in there, and within a minute, I'll show you a test of it. It runs through a series of lights that flash into the eye and gives us the exact objective, not subjective, objective measurement 
that's there. It's easy. It's small. It's got a very small footprint. It's fast, bilateral in less than a minute. <clears throat> this is one I do feel confident with my staff doing. I don't have to worry if they miss something and I'm going to miss a brain aneurysm. Distance uh, or more commonly glaucoma. I don't miss that many brain aneurysms. They don't show, don't show up, but glaucoma does. Distance allowing post-COVID, uh, which I think is important today. And then finally, it's required for billing and completeness of your exam. So here's how it works. Uh, it presents some monocular stimuli, and that stimuli is really uh, the key. It's fairly, it's not overly bright either. Patients don't leave saying, wow, that was so bright. It's just a normal. And because they're in that area, it doesn't have to be high intensity stimuli, and they still can record binocular pupil response. From that, the amplitude's measured, the velocity of direct and consensual pupillary reflexes, and then any asymmetry is presented as an RAPD, which is the definition of asymmetry between the two eyes, and it gives you an exact score from one to four. And it's the same score we would use if we were doing the swinging flashlight test, but the difference here is that this works, um, and this is sensitive, and this can measure a 0.3 or a point, point 0.1 wouldn't be anything, but it can measure any level of RAPD. I'm going to take you through this here as a video in terms of kind of what happens. And, and this is what the technician would see since I don't run these tests, nor will you, but your staff will. Very simple to key in the patient's name, click on the eye, they take a look in there, and then the response takes place. And so this is now from the beginning to the end of a typical patient I might see. This is the patient walking in the room. I put them, we put them, technician puts them into just looking through that little uh, device where it has the little uh, spectacle, kind of the press things they go on to. So now you have a nice environment there. What's really amazing is if it's not centered, um, as you see here, and this is just showing you all the steps, I can take my finger or the staff wheel and move the circle in the center. It's all touch screen. So talk about efficient. That bell tells you the first light is going, the patient is lined up. This is all in actual time. What you're seeing here is from the beginning, and you'll notice we started our clock just a few seconds ago, about four seconds. Um, these are all of them done. Uh, it continues to monitor both eyes for consensual and reflex. There's a green little circle that outlines the pupil, so you can see where that is. And you'll notice you don't have to be exactly centered to get absolutely perfect measurements. You can be off a little bit. You just want to be in the pupil. Um, that's the key. So I, that's why I didn't even, don't even need to center it. You just have to be in the pupillary range. There you go, about 30 seconds, and you get your final answers. What's really nice about that is all of that is then presented to me, um, and they can print that out, they can send it to the ER, and we get our measurements. So here's the exam results of a different patient. What you just saw turned out to be you know, 0.08. That means no RAPD, very healthy pupillary response between the two eyes. Here you're looking at a patient in contrast who has some disease process. The RAPD score is 0.7 roughly or 0.69. Anything over 0.3 is significant. Certainly over 0.5 is an RAPD. It's just we don't typically put down the halves when we did the swinging flashlight test because we, how would you pick that up unless you did neutral density filters, which again, I'd argue few of us know how to do that. Well, at least I'll speak for myself. I wouldn't take the time to do it. Um, Nevertheless, you can see here a clinically significant RAPD in this patient. Uh, you can see it's about 0.7. You can tell that it's in the right eye. Now, there's a lot of information in between. A little box tells us, you know, all the information that's present. Um, it tells us where the RAPD score is. It gives uh, direct um, mean, all this data. But really what I focus on is, number one, the RAPD score, which is the same as a, a grade one RAPD, two, three, 0.7 in this case, or 0.69. It's the amplitude of constriction, percentage change, amplitude of constriction, latency, uh, max velocity constriction, max velocity recovery. Now, you can also use it for most of your perla too. You, you can look at your pupil size, equal, reactive, light, dim. So you could get your measurements for everything you need for perla here. But the important data for me, in terms of pathologies, the RAPD, and an objective measurement of it. So this patient, I would think, has a pathology. I'm going to look at the optic nerves extremely closely. I'm going to look for glaucoma. I'm going to look for, you know, their eye movement a little bit more carefully myself. That way, I'm not doing all these tests on every single patient. Like, I'm not going to do an EOM on every patient that walks in. It's already kind of done. 
if I've got an RAPD, I'm going to be looking for palsies. I'm going to look a little more carefully at how that eye moves. I'm going to be asking about diplopia. I'm going to be looking at the optic nerves. I'm going to ask them if they, you know, carry, if they reach for the milk and it falls out because I'm worried about multiple sclerosis. I'm going to look for optic neuritis and swelling. So it's such a critical test of pathology diagnosis, but I'm not going to want to, I, I mean, I should be doing that on every single patient and I am looking at their nerves, new patients, but I'm become much more focused in my methodology because of the fact that I had a positive RAPD in this patient. And I think that becomes very important for me to discern what's going on and to really prevent a patient from having serious pathology. Contrast to that was the case we had earlier, the 0.08. Well, that's normal. And, and that's exactly where it should be. And you can see that everything's pretty much aligned. I can get the PERLA information from this, that's plenty for me, um, everything but accommodation. And then I'm able to produce really what I want knowing that that's fine. Now I'm still gonna do a thorough exam, but I'm less concerned with looking at EOMs. I'm less concerned with perhaps running a visual field. I'm gonna be looking at the optic nerve, but I may not look as carefully in terms of you know, discernment and all those as compared to having an RAPD because I expecting things to be normal. Now, could you have glaucoma and have a non-RAPD case? Sure, if the eyes are symmetric and glaucoma is progressing the same in both eyes, but that's typically late stage disease. Could happen any time, but it's typically later. I don't see that very often in early disease. I certainly don't see it in moderate disease as well in my own clinical experience. And to date, I've never had a case of an early diagnosis of glaucoma, at least that's my own personal experience, that didn't have a positive RAPDX score. So I think that really becomes essential in management. So here I have a patient with a 0.69 that is a glaucoma patient. Um, right eye sees less, as you're seeing, that's why it's there. It's almost like a filter there. Um, and for that reason, we're not getting that exact response. And you can see the measurement is there for me. All right. Actually, before we do the case, let's do our third polling question. Uh, Ian, I think this would be a good time to, to ask it. Okay, here we go. All right, on average, I find an APD, be honest, if you're using a swinging flashlight or your staff is using it, how often do they find an APD? I'll leave the poll open for another 30 seconds or so. We had 80% uh, of the audience uh, participated in the last poll. So let's see if we can get to 85% this time. Or how about 90? How about 100? You know, says a lot about our attendees today while they're doing this survey is that um, over 80% of those that registered are here. That is really unheard of. Uh, you know, it's, it's typically you get about half. So it says, I mean, these are these are good quality colleagues of mine who are saying, you know, I signed up, I'm gonna be there. That that's that always impresses me. I don't think I've ever seen 80% to be fair in a webinar. And it's, you know, same speaker, other topics. So this, this says a lot about this group, not speaker, because I've had less than 50 plenty of times. Absolutely, okay, I'm gonna close the poll and we'll see the results. All right, so this is interesting. So on average, I find an APD almost never was 49%, so half the audience. That is it right there. I mean, I wouldn't even go on. That says it all. That says three things. Number one, phenomenal attendees, truly honest, high integrity, because that would be my answer too before this technology. Um, you know, number two, um, that's realistic. So it is really kind of what we would see if we were to test everybody who, who's doing a, a swinging flashlight test. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you take into account the percentage, this is the number three comment, of RAPDs that should be present, assuming a diagnosis of glaucoma, how many happen? Number of exams done, you know, in terms of per, per doctor, um, that is over the course of the year. Optometry seeing about 88% of comprehensive eye exams in the United States, for example, and Canada, North America. Uh, that means you should see an RAPD about once a week. That's still not a lot, maybe even twice if you have a high medical practice, but as a 
primary care optometrist um, maybe once about once a week. So nearly never think about the difference in the two. And all that once a week is based on is just the percentage of patients that should have glaucoma on first diagnosis, assuming there's about 6 million that have been diagnosed, 3 to 2.7 million currently being treated. They say double of that. And they would be diagnosed if we did our APDs, the sensitive. So that's 6 million based on the number of patients that we see in the course of a year divided by 50 weeks would be about 1.1 1, 1. 1 a week. So that just shows how much disease we're missing. Not, not because of intentionally, just because technology has not advanced until now with pupillary testing to be able to pick up those things. So, so that is awesome to hear half the group um, are that high and honest and, and realistic about what we're seeing, but also shows the need, uh, Ian, for, for what we have to have. So I'm going to give you some examples. I've had this technology in my office now for, when did I buy this? About a year. Am I right? Not quite. Um, maybe about a little under that, about a year, a year, a year and a half. So I've been able to run this through all my patients. This becomes one of our automatic tests on all new patients that come in. And anybody that has a you know, chief complaint that warrants it becomes if they're a follow-up patient. So we're not doing it, you know, but I think it is really that critical. I, I like to do it on everybody every single time. 68-year-old uh, African-American male coming in. And, and both my cases are African-American patients, not, not by coincidence, just... Have, I do have a larger uh, population um, of all patients that come in in the glaucoma category into my clinic, but it just so happens these were two of my first patients um, that I was able to do some testing on uh, that I then collected these cases. Um, so not much in terms of the, uh, the present mental uh, uh, history as well as the family medical history. Um, initial presentations 2020 in both eyes. IOPs were high normal 21-22. CDs didn't seem like any significance to me at 0 0.6, 0 0.6 at both eyes. Now, what's interesting about this case is that this patient was seen before. That's why I tried to figure out when I bought the eye kinetics. So 2017 would definitely be before I ever purchased this. Um, but nevertheless, uh, here was their original OCT. Uh, here's the original finding, ganglion nerve complex, everything I could find completely green. Um, and normal in terms of what, what is going on there uh, back in 2017. Now, the patient, um, you know, over the period of time, visual fields were at the normal level, uh, fundus photography was taken so I could capture the optic nerves, pachymetry a little on the thin side, I would grant you that with 505 and 510. So the question is, should I treat that patient? And I think if all of us, well, I don't know, you guys may have your own views. I'll tell you what I did. I mean, looking at that, I didn't see any significant pathology. CDs were symmetric at 0 0.66, uh, 0.6 and 0.6. Vision was fine. Um, now, I do have a mother, which, you know, maternal parent is critical with primary open angle glaucoma, but I really felt like this is one to watch. I was a little concerned about the PACs. I didn't have other technologies at the time, histories, et cetera, but nevertheless, I, I said, let's watch. I don't think we need to treat this at this point. I do have the one-year follow-up, um, which seemed fairly normal, too. There was a little thinning of the nerve fiber layer, but not significant to where it wasn't, you know, five microns per year. That kind of thing was well under that. So two years later, no treatment. Um, now he comes in. IOP is the same. 2021, identical. He's been followed for two years. And keep in mind, I see glaucoma patients every three months. That's just, if you're diagnosed with glaucoma or you're a suspect, I have a three-month follow-up for you where I'm going to continue to monitor you. Um, if you're a suspect, I don't want to miss something. Uh, the number one reason for malpractice suits against optometry is failure to diagnose. And if you want to be real specific, failure to diagnose glaucoma is the number one. So I feel like I need to follow this patient. Over that time, he's had five readings in two years. He's had a pressure as high as 23. So you say, okay, that's a little above that 22 standard deviation, two standard deviations from norm. Are you more concerned now? Well, no, I still didn't see a lot of the one year, didn't see anything in 2017, but guess what I purchased between that and now? I've got an eye kinetics. So I run the eye kinetics on this gentleman and I get, this is actually a different image, but same score, 0.69, different patient, different image, 0.69. I think, wow, I didn't notice that before. I didn't have this technology. Guess what we did on every exam he came in? Swinging flashlight pupil tests. Went back and looked at them, normal, perla, equal reactive, no afferent pupillary defect. You know, to be honest, if I, if I did it 
and it was a 0.7, I wouldn't pick up an RAPD either with a swinging flash look test. I just don't have that ability to pick up that subtle of a difference. So no fault on the technicians, fault on the fact that, you know, this technology Mark has got invented belonged 100 years ago, doesn't belong today. And so it's not going to pick up these subtle technologies or subtle changes like technology will. Look at his optic nerve head photos, uh, 2019, just to show you completeness there. I mean, I'd say that's probably a little more than before, um, you know, but I'm not seeing a Drantz heme. I'm not seeing asymmetry that I would think would have told me what was going on. But yet the retinal nerve fiber layer, the, the ganglion complex, the retinal ganglion cells, that's where the asymmetry is in a relative afferent pupillary defect. So you wouldn't be looking at the optic nerve and saying, why is there an RAPD? Those nerves look the same. There's many more sensitive nerves in the bundles that go from there in your nerve fiber layer that can have an effect, that can change. And that's where the asymmetry comes in that gives you the RAPD. So I wanted to show you these fundus photographs just to emphasize that key point. And guess what? Visual fields within normal limits. And I would say his optic nerves are within normal limits, even though it's a large CD. I'm not seeing notching. I am seeing cupping. I'm not seeing asymmetry. So thank goodness I got one test that told me I need to look more carefully. Now we are seeing changes, especially in OD. The retinal nerve fiber layer is starting to show uh, significant changes. Uh, we're getting down into that under 75 range in retinal nerve fiber layer from, from above high to mid 80s, um, you know, over that time. Um, and again, the visits in between were normal. I do my OCT on a suspect once a year. Um, is a high suspect, I might do it a little sooner, like with a positive RAPD, for example, and eye kinetics. I might move that up. But in general, it was once a year back then when I didn't have this technology, didn't show up on either of the visits. Here it is, 2019, significant difference. What did this teach me? It taught me that technology really helps identify disease and that glaucoma is almost always this way. I wouldn't say 100% because there's going to be some rare case where it's symmetric at the beginning, I'm sure. But but here is the asymmetry we typically see with one eye over another, and that's glaucoma. I wish everything would work exactly the same, both sides all the time. That's not how nerves function. And notice this poor gentleman's also starting to have, and I got OS and OD flip, sorry. So OD is on your right. You're seeing now the beginning of probably a nasal step um, and an arcuate defect. So I think a couple things are good. Number one, Thank goodness I had my kinetics to be able to identify there was disease here and to look more carefully. Um, number two, the disease can progress like that and can change even though things seem really normal. Number three, wish I had an eye kinetics in 2017 or 2018 because I probably would have picked up on that and been a little more likely to start treating the gentleman sooner. Now, here we are in 2020. I have seen the same patient doing fine. Uh, I've got him on good uh, glaucoma medications. His pressures are hitting my target. His visual fields have not progressed. So thank goodness it's a slow progressing disease. But here we have, you know, visual defects. Um, and, and if I had that technology sooner, I probably could have prevented it, but I'm still okay. He's not noticing the differences. I'm not getting rapid progression. I think I have him in a really good place and he's going to do fine. But it's just a great case to help understand so many of the intricacies around how our pupils work and how they interact with our nerve function. Second case, a 41-year-old African-American female, young patient. Now, she's referred over for a second opinion. Now, my clinic's all referral-based. I don't do any primary care. I don't have spectacles or contact lenses. I have some bandage lenses and some sclerals, and I try some new technologies here and there, but it's not my primary clinic. It's, I, I typically focus on those referred in, and I get glaucoma patients, um, but I'm mainly cornea. A referring doctor wanted to start medications, but he said, Paul, I'd love for you to take a look. Um, I'm not sure if I should begin. And what really convinced him to probably start, and you look at that last case, he probably, if I'd started, I would have been better there, but not really. I don't. Th I think if I saw that same OCT without eye kinetics, if I saw all that I saw in 2017 in the last case, I probably would have treated the same way 95% of the time, unless something triggered a difference like in eye kinetics. Positive family history. Mother had glaucoma. Maternal parent again. That's why I wanted this case. Look at the sim how symmetry or how align these cases are. No current ocular therapy, no systemic diseases or medications. Okay, take a look at what we're seeing. All right, look at the optic nerves. There's a little bit of cupping. Might look like OD is showing a little larger CD than OS. 
but 2015, um, pressure is 24. Hmm. Yeah, I'm a little concerned. You know, I want to know what the pachymetry is. I want to know what hysteresis is. want to get a few ideas to see if, if that is significant. Because if I had a pack of 480, I'm going to be much more concerned. IOP Goldman uh, was 10 to 23. Um, IOP with, uh, or, or with our aura much more accurate. It was actually a little lower at 21. Uh, normal and NAP angles were four. So definitely a primary open angle glaucoma. All right, what else would I want to know? Well, I want to know the visual fields. And so there's, you know, visual field sign off again. That's my signature down there. So I looked at this one. Everything looks perfect. I'm not seeing any significant depression. Maybe two decibel to minus two. No, not enough to count. So I'm okay. And repeated test was similar. Few, you know, testing errors the first time, a little better the second time, but I'm not seeing any pathology based on visual fields. So then I run OCTs. And OCT is, again, sometimes I look at a nerve on the OCT and I look, wow, that CD looks a little, well, not too much different, maybe a little bit larger, especially in that left eye. It looks like it's closer to the rim. But really, if you go back to that picture and this one, they're almost identical. And then most important thing for me is looking at the average retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Uh, so up here in the green, uh, I see that I've got, as I magnified over here on your right, 97 microns, 97 microns. 92%, I'm thinking probably don't need to treat. But here's a case where the primary doc was ready to treat, pressures of 24. Uh, pachymetry, uh, by the way, just for purposes, and so it was about 550 or average. Mother had glaucoma. Um, all the pressures end up being above average. CDs probably seven to eight, larger than our last case, which started at 6.6 and 0.6 and was very symmetric. Here we're like sevens to even eight in the left eye point eights. So how many of you would treat it? Well, the doc I talk, talked to said, yeah, I'm ready to treat this patient. I'm thinking 41 years old, we got a lot of time here. Let's watch it. Let's take it easy. Let's make sure. And so fortunately that's the key, but what really helped me to make that decision, I mean, you have some factors here that could weigh you either way and you're making the decision on this webinar. African-American race, that's a positive. That could be more likely glaucoma positive family history, mother. That's a positive. You saw the last case that progressed within two years. You have suspect nerves that are 0.7, you might argue on OCT, almost 0.8. IOPs were in the low 20s, sometimes teens, but low 20s and teens, depending on where you measured it, but as high as 24 from the previous, uh, mid 20s from the previous doctor and from one of our tests up to 24. Do you treat? What else would you want to look at? Well, of course, you're going to want to look at pupil testing since it's a pupil webinar. And here we go, 0.04. That looks good to me. That's fantastic. Packs were good. Everything else was fine. Let's not worry about putting you on a medication for the rest of your life. I think that you're really showing that you just have a large CD. And I asked the patient, you know, do you remember if your mother went blind from glaucoma or was just diagnosed with glaucoma? I mean, I worked with a, a doctor a few years ago, um, an older ophthalmologist, very good um, in cornea and stuff like that. But if he had a pressure above 22, uh, that was trying to treat for glaucoma. He was just from a different school. Um, and, and so there are probably patients like that that are were diagnosed. I remember I cured more glaucoma in the first six months I was there than I could ever have imagined. And and so nevertheless, uh, it's not the practice I'm at today, of course, it's a whole ways back, but um, a few years. And and so I, point being, uh, you know, there are cases where maybe the mother was just large CDs like this patient, or maybe it was high pressure because ocular hypertension. This patient had 24s on one of the readings. So I still, she's a suspect. She comes in on a regular basis for testing. I think she's on a three times a year schedule. And um, fortunately, most of the stuff now continues to show that the RAPD helped in my confirmation, helped me feel confident about what I was doing. And guess what? This is a year later. Actually, I just got the two year data. She was in two weeks ago. I should have, it was too late. I already made this presentation. She was in like 10 days ago. Uh, VA is still 2025. I can tell you that today. No change in optic nerve head. Uh, no disc hemorrhages, no noted RNFL changes, no thickness changes. Pressures remaining 18, 19 at the last visit. Her last visit this time was, I looked at it because I knew I was presenting today, was 1920, so very close. Uh, OCT remains stable. She's still not on medications. 
her. Uh, I do eye kinetics on her every time she comes in. And here's the difference from, uh, you know, the last visit to two years later, um, today being two, 97 and 97 for her retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Those are the two I'm going to focus on. Here's her most recent visit, um, 96, 95. And you can tell over the course of a year, you know, uh, anywhere around five microns is significant. Anything within about three microns as a change or less is considered fine, no pathology. So she's obviously almost no change. We'll keep watching her and continue to monitor her. 0.7 CDs are very consistent, no significant change and no change in pupillary testing. So what's exciting about this technology is, you know, we can use this uh, for measuring so many diseases, optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis, glaucoma, ischemic optic neuropathy, such as anterior ischemic optic neuropathy or temporal arteritis, which can lead to bilateral blindness or strokes, ischemic retinal disease, optic nerve de uh, compression, such as in our patients with Graves disease. Um, I had a patient today with, with significant Graves and never been diagnosed, um, sent her in for thyroid testing, but she had classic Stallwake sign. What's really interesting about her case today is, sorry, I'm getting on a tangent, but as, as I'd have her look down, her eyelid would stick as it was coming up and then it'd be Stalwags with the big white above it. I thought that's the coolest video. I had to get a video of it um, as because of the proptosis uh, without a diagnosis. Uh, orbital disease, uh, midbrain lesions. We looked at the Edinger Westfall nucleus. We looked at the pathway that was all midbrain controlled, which is where the majority of significant pathologies like a third nerve palsy would take place, pending aneurysm, trauma, concussions. Um, I have a family member who's a, uh, a college varsity uh, athlete. She's she's pretty impressive uh, player. She was one of the only freshmen to play collegiate um, soccer last year um, at the school. And won't give the school away or any other stuff just for HIPAA, but she's, uh, especially after saying it's a family member, not my direct family, but close. And um, uh, got, unfortunately, in her uh, started her as a freshman, which normally never happens at that level. And uh, she was able to develop, uh, she ended up getting a second game. Someone moved at the last moment, got hit by a soccer ball, developed a concussion. And she showed up with, uh, we tested her for positive RAPD. So trauma can, can do that too. We continue to monitor her, but it's been, you know, since December or November last year and she's fine. So glaucoma was where I want to kind of finish off here. There is need for an objective test that assists with glaucoma diagnosis. So the most common reason for malpractice suits and optometry is failure to diagnose, and in particular, failure to diagnose glaucoma. 80% of glaucoma diagnosis is based on IOP would actually be wrong, meaning there are patients who have higher pressures like this last case that'll probably never develop glaucoma. Thank goodness for good testing to monitor it. And more than 50% of the patients with normal tension develop glaucoma. 50% of the Baltimore eye study for normal tension glaucoma, um, as you looked at, were patients who had, uh, you know, who had normal pressure. So 50% of the people in the Baltimore eye study uh, that had true glaucoma were in normal tension ranges under 22. And of course, it's higher in, in certain races like African American and Asian. Early asymmetry loss will result in a positive RAPD. Pupil testing previously was difficult. This is a quick pretest diagnostic your staff can do and you can feel confident in their answer. It's inexpensive, it is fast, it is efficient, and it's accurate. It's objective, detailed, and easy to use. It's a very small little device to get put in any pretesting room. Uh, it's something I feel now confident with my staff doing and getting the right answers every time. Generates more appropriate medical visits, helps me to have a better uh, a diagnosis of glaucoma percentage and other diseases provides objective documentation to support medical necessity of other tests for further reimbursement. And it is far more sensitive than the human uh, in terms of capabilities of, of being able to uh, pick up a pupillary defect with a swinging flashlight test. So with that, I will take a few questions. I only have about four minutes of questions, Ian, I apologize, but um, maybe we can take a few. Great, thank you. So uh, here we go. Um, first question unrelated to iKinetics is what would you say normal RNFL thickness is on OCT? Um, oh, I would say, you know, normal is probably, depends on age because it does thin with time as you, as you know with OCT, but 
you know, I think it's more change dependent than it is normal numbers. Meaning, I think some people are born with RNFLs that are 95 microns and some are born with 120 and 130. And so it's more important to see and measure the change. I have diagnosed patients who've gone from like 110 to 85 in, in like four or five years or maybe seven years, maybe it wasn't that fast, but still that, and it was all, that's green. If you look at your OCTs, that's considered green and normal. That's glaucoma. It was asymmetric, positive pupillary RAPD with eye kinetics. And it was the change in RFL that's more important than the absolute number. Now, from an OCT standpoint, anything under 70 is considered pathognomonic or pathological for a dry eye, for dry for, for glaucoma, primary open angle or other glaucoma. Anything under 75 is suspect. But I will tell you, don't get caught up in those numbers. Uh, look at the exact number I showed you, the 97, 96, 95 that I had in that little area for average retinal nerve fiber layer. Look at the isn't or this T-stint and make sure that you're following that. And changes there are much more important than absolute numbers. All right, thank you. Next question. Um, does the instrument show any unusual findings in concussions? And yes. Like Great question. My my niece, uh, Jeeper. So, you know, what's really interesting is it, it'll pick up on any of that. And I've, and I've figured that when the patient no longer has this issue, unless there is traumatic brain injury, which they will maintain in our APD, but when it does recover, um, this is a great way to know if perhaps they could be good to return to sport. Now, that's got to have more studies. I'm, I'm basing it on just very few patients. But I am basing it on a very close family patient, and I do believe that was a, it really is what picked up her concussion. Hers was significant, and it's been able to show improvements over time as she's continued to improve. So, yeah, I think it is. Now, a traumatic brain injury, you know, someone who's a veteran and fought in, in wars, whatever, and has shrapnel traumatic brain injury, that won't improve that type of damage. But concussion damage, I do think, changes. And RAPD is one of those reflexes that is affected because of the midbrain. And I do believe it's a great indicator for concussion. And just to echo your comment, uh, Dr. Karpecki, um, from a company perspective, um, I agree with you that uh, we, we need more data on this, but I think it is uh, potentially interesting. I agree. We need more data on it, more studies on it, but there's, there's something here. Uh, next question is, how is this instrument different from its predecessor, Rapidex? So that's a good question. I'll take that if, uh, if that's okay with you, Paul. Um, Please. It's, it's smaller. It's much faster. It's much easier on the patient. Uh, the computer that runs the device uh, is, a, uh, is a calibrated instrument that also runs our color vision program, color DX CCTHD, and it comes with a free trial, so doctors can actually use that. In, in, in the US, that's a reimbursable test, and they can use that for free for 90 days. Um, so those are the key differences, smaller, faster, easier on the patient, and um, it's faster means less blinking, less time to blink, and it does a better job of capturing data even if there is a blink so it's it's the algorithm is a lot smarter in terms of track, tracking the pupils and tracking blinks uh, let's see next question um what is the false positive false negative rate so you find an apd but there's but there's nothing else so does that end up being a an mri or a, or a neuro consult well, I think that, you know, false positives, false negatives are very few in my experience. I mean, we did talk about the potential for an asymmetric disease. You would get an RAPD. It was symmetric, which I think is very relatively rare. You could have pathology, including glaucoma, that uh, would not show an RAPD. But I, I, I don't know exact numbers. I will tell you I've not had a single one of those cases in my clinical experience. Um, unless they get really advanced in, in glaucoma. And by then, I mean, we're going to pick it up. We don't need the sensitive test for advanced glaucoma. Uh, so I'm, I'm not aware of an early case like the cases I showed you today where I haven't seen asymmetry originally. Um, now, yes, there are going to be potential for cases, not third nerve palsies, not 
and either the aneurysm pending, you wouldn't get a bilateral that I'm aware of. You could have a chiasmatic bitemporal lesion that could still give you symmetry, that still could give you a non-RAPD where you still have to do imaging, but that's where why it's so important to look at pupils, uh, visual fields, um, in addition to those two together, and even color vision like color DX, for example. That's where that trifecta of neurological assessment is so critical. So, um, you know, Conan has ob object field coming out, they have color DX, and they have obviously eye kinetics. So there's your neuro suite right there. Um, and in cases where you have all three, you're not likely to have a false negative um, or a false positive, but relying on one test, even though I'd say it's extremely rare, I couldn't even give you numbers, one in a few hundreds, um, on one that could be a false positive, you're not likely to get three false positives. And this is a follow-up question. Do you repeat qu uh, testing if there is a difference, but no, in other words, an APD, but no obvious reason for the asymmetry? I do. That's a great question, and it's important. If I get anybody above 0.3, I'll make that as their only way we're going to repeat testing. I actually like, as I said, eye kinetics because it's so fast and it's more accurate on everyone every time just for efficiency. But I have some staff because we have multiple staff we share that are so used to swinging flashlight tests that I say every new patient, every glaucoma patient, um, every, you know, I want only eye kinetics and they're good at doing that. Um, but I also include any patient that's previously had an a, uh, asymmetric effect and our APD above 0.3. I think it just kind of helps me to know, um, you know, verify to repeat. It's very consistent though, um, to be continue to look for pathology. Um, but I do like to find, kind of like a non-2020, I've got to find an answer. It'll bug me until I figure out what it might be. But I do repeat it um, every time they come in on those abnormals. All right. Well, Ian, I, I want to thank you and, and certainly, certainly Conan Medical. I would encourage all you in attendance to have a rep, uh, go over the technology with you. I think you're going to be amazed at what it can do. Uh, how it helps your practice, the clinical relevance and in today's COVID environment, how helpful that will be. I want to thank all of you for making time in your busy schedules, especially in COVID, as we mentioned, where all of us are busier and, and different things. I, I, I hope that your families are safe, that you are doing well. And, and thank you for the time. Thank you, Conan, for putting on this program. Have a wonderful night. Thank you, Dr. Kopecki, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Be safe out there.